Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, folks. As mentioned in our daily financial news, it is Thursday, and that means we bring on the one and only Jonathan Twomley. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing very well, Michael. How are you? I'm doing great. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank you. You shared a video from your uh, personal mastermind group that you host. Uh, from Ryan Severino. Hopefully mm -hmm. I got that right. Yeah. Uh, a great economist does a lot of work there. And really the topic for the discussion was around, or at least a portion of the discussion was around, this is not the 1970s. Uh, I actually think we are in the 1970s or, or a version of it. So this that was a very important conversation for me to hear about. Uh, so do you want to kind of summarize what uh, you and Ryan talked about? And then we'll, we'll, we'll discuss some details. Yeah, I mean, the summary basically is that the causes of the inflation that we're experiencing right now are quite different from what happened in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And because of that, we're really not looking at a stagflation kind of environment uh, like we did in the 70s. So, you know, his argument is essentially that, uh, you know, the 70s were caused by supply side shocks, mm -hmm. right? And it just raised the cost of doing business so dramatic, so so suddenly and so dramatically, because the major input, input what happened was essentially OPEC caused it, right? Yep, there's By, a four month oil embargo that really yeah, that just that just like shut everything down, caused prices to spike across the board, uh, and what's happened? And so it wasn't led by consumer demand; it was led by mm -hmm. supply shocks. Mm -hmm. What Ryan says is going on now is essentially a, a huge amount of pent up demand being released after emerging from COVID and the supply chain is just not able to handle it. Mm. So that's a different, very different kind of uh, pressure on the economy leading to inflation that, that will clear eventually. And then, you know, there's also real wage growth happening as a result of, you know, labor just having more power than it's had in a very long time. So, yeah. uh, which is caused by demographics uh, in his argument. So mm -hmm. um, we can talk about the labor shortage too, but uh, that's that's his argument essentially. So what was it that you took from? from well, there, so so first off, it was um, it caused me to go back and ask myself questions, which any good you know in, in any any rational person would after hearing Ryan talk so eloquently. But but I, I actually just wanted I don't I guess debate or discuss probably discuss is the right word. Because I think too, I think people, and maybe Ryan as well, are kind of being too literal about comparing 2020 to 70s, right? They're like, hey, we had an oil shock, oil embargo, oil was in everything. Uh, it was shut down for four months and you know, things just went wonky for a while. And then when oil came back on, it was, it was just priced higher. I actually think we are experiencing the same thing, just not in a raw commodity. I, and you actually brought it up. I think it's labor. I think one of the things that we are seeing now is a labor constraint, a labor supply, if you want to use your same vernacular, right? We had a supply shock. I think we have a labor shock. I think there's a lot of, I think the demographics, right? 3.5 million people above trend have retired. We have 4.2 million people quitting. We have record entrepreneurship. I think there is a, and it's not going to be four months, right? The oil embargo was four months. And then we suffered for roughly a decade. I think this labor equation is going to be years in the making, uh, all along dragging wages higher, which will ripple through the economy for years to come. That's that's kind of where I'm at. I think I think wages is our oil of the 70s, or employment, or hours, or however you want to break it down, is our thing of this decade. Okay, I'm not really sure how to respond to that. I mean, no, like, I, no. Like, Do, I does it make sense, or I mean, am I am I? Yeah, I'm just trying to think about it. I mean, uh, I, I mean, I, there's certainly like it definitely creates pressure on the economy for sure, right? Mm -hmm. I think the issue is whether it's healthy inflation mm -hmm. or whether it's unhealthy inflation, and I think that's sort of where what the debate is about, right? Mm -hmm. Because I think nobody would argue that what that the that the combination of Inflation and low growth, which is that's what stagnation was. Oh, absolutely, that's stag or stag stag stagflation, right? That was the problem. So, usually, so like historically, what happens is you have the economy grows, right? It keeps on growing, keeps on growing, pulls more and more people into the labor force until you sure. have a labor shortage. Then you have wage price inflation, 
And then eventually what that ha what happens is that, you know, prices hit some level where people just don't want to pay anymore. So they pull back and then you have a, that's basically the business cycle, right? It's business cycle, yeah. Basically the business cycle. The stagflation of the 70s was different because the inflation wasn't caused by that, those pull factors, those like those beneficial factors of the economy growing. It was caused by the shock of suddenly OPEC basically cut off the supply of oil. Yep. And then when they turned it back on, it was at a much higher level. Yeah, and they, reset. They were, yep. they were very good at maintaining that cartel for quite some time. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that, but that caused, you know, the spike in prices because oil probably less so than it is now at the time oil was like an imp input into everything. Right. It was, I mean, yep. and, mm -hmm. you know, like it just couldn't, the, the, the price of oil affected the price of everything. Everything. Yeah. And so, and now, you know, we're much more energy efficient. There are many more alternative sources of energy. You know, it's just not as much stuff is made from different materials. Like it's just not the same kind of problem mm -hmm. that, it, that it was, you know, we produce a lot of our own oil now. I mean, mm -hmm. like, just like so many things have changed yeah. since then. So that, it, I mean, oil is not a problem in, in, in that sense, but the, but the, but I think the issue was, it was not like, it, it did at the same time, it caused everything to spike, but it also caused the economy to grind to a halt, right? Well, because, I, because oil was, it, yeah, right. Because oil was such a big, a, a big input into everything. Whereas now, now what it's looking like is a little bit more like the business cycle on steroids, mm. plus the, this, the supply chain not being able to catch up because, mm -hmm. you know, we've moved over to, you know, just in time, just in time production. The supply chains are strung out all over the world. There's mm -hmm. like only one supply chain for everything instead of <laughs> multiple ones. Like yeah. so, you know, we've kind of like in the name of efficiency over the last forty years, we kind of like shot ourselves in the foot. It's like it's set this moment up, right? Yeah, and, we did. And and you know, it's, it's one of those things. Like if COVID had never happened, like maybe we would not have have um, you know experienced this so maybe it's a good thing that we now know like hey we got to do something with, about our supply chains right and that's going to take time but that but the, it's a different factor right i think that's what our what brian's argument is yeah it, it's not it's not like simultaneously like raising the price of everything and at the same time causing everything to shut down because the prices got raised so much like prices like here's one thing like one bit of i guess evidence of, of sure. for, for ryan's point is that High prices are not causing people to stop spending money. Oh, no question. Right. 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 Like Correct. they're just going out and spending more money because they want to spend money. And like everybody's like, we're just going to spend like drunken sailors. And, you know, that's that's driving a lot of this. So the, the the ports and everything just can't keep up. And it doesn't also seem like, at least I'm not hearing it. Maybe I'm missing something, but I'm not hearing like there ha anybody's having trouble producing the stuff either. It's So it's like, we're buying it like crazy. Hmm. They're, wherever it's getting made, it's getting made. The problem is like the ports have become this big bottleneck mm -hmm. and, and it takes forever to get stuff. So that yeah. also suggests to me that like, it's not like a structural problem mm. or like with oil or it's sure. more like, well, we got this, this bottleneck that needs to, it still needs to be worked out. And hopefully, I mean, honestly, my fear now is that um, the pressure on the people who work at the docks yeah. And the and and the and the truckers yep. is going to be so high. It's going to cause even more of them to quit. Yeah, like that's that's I, I agree. Think, like, that could be a huge problem if that happens. If, if because it, then the economy really could grind to a halt. If mm -hmm. if like those guys just start walking, you out won't even mass. need very many of them. I mean, you lose yeah. five, eight. I mean, you you lose single digits. It's that stretched. Yeah. It yeah. could really cause some issues. I mean, I think I think we may wind up honestly with like them calling out the national guard. To like, I, on, I think to so like, too. I think that's going to be the gonna, result. Yeah, in, in in numerous states that have you know big ports where it's all backed up, like just they just need manpower and and trucks. And it's like, okay, well, we're just going to come get the national guard trucks, get the get the guys out, and just clear the clear the ports out. You yep, know, because, I agree. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think that will happen. Um, because I, I yeah. It, it's it's, it's going to be interesting. I think I think that will be the end result as we call in the National Guard or military to you know go work at it for ninety days and just because right now the Southern California has over a hundred ships, right? Yeah, it, it was eighty two and then ninety three and now it's yeah, one hundred one. And the previous record was like eighteen or something. Yeah, it was like right? eight. It was like, it was like yeah, yeah, it was uh, under twenty. Yeah, yeah, and I mean New York too. It's not as bad, but you can see them backed up in the harbor, oh, right? Wow. You know, here like it's just 
so it's not it's yeah. it's not this port is not as big anymore as it used to be but it's still it's still a major port and it's you know yeah you see this you can see the ships backed up so yeah it's gonna be interesting uh, i still think there's some I, it, it'll be interesting i think it's still very early i i do think wages or labor or hours or whatever that instrument right oils and oils a barrel right i don't know how you calculate yeah. wages and employees but i think we're suffering an, an employment shock uh less people demographics all of that and again i think i think it really could lead to stagflation we're just early because again we've already seen how do you get a full staff you raise wages and yeah. then when you raise wages, you have to raise prices, right? There's a famous restaurant, or not famous, but a, a restaurant I've talked about in New York several times. They were paying 15 or 17, couldn't staff, couldn't get people to show up for interviews. Now it's 25, two full staffs, and then they raise prices 30%. I think that's going to go, and it's a slow moving process. Oil is like, it's in everything. And what you either got to buy it or you don't produce. I think wages is going to ripple through for but months, if not quarters. I think that's the difference, though, okay. between stagflation and what's going on now, mm -hmm. because the economy can work this out, right? Like this, this, mm -hmm. you know, rise in prices, it'll ripple through the economy, correct? Right, but the economy can absorb this, right? The problem with oil was it just made everything because the economy couldn't absorb it. It right. was like a, there wasn't was an like alternative. A, yeah, it was just a huge shock, mm -hmm. and it and it was like. You just it happened so quickly that it just couldn't be dealt with right yeah. so i think that's the difference okay. I, that, you know as opposed to now where like that this is what happens in the economy and frankly like <laughs> yeah you know people are people are um you know they're so we've had like five percent inflation and obviously that's it's higher than we're used to but that's really the issue it's not that this is historically very high inflation this is just right. we we have had low inflation for such a long time yes uh because of factors like automation and the you know a growing population and there being a you know a lot of labor out there plus you know automation outsourcing right mm -hmm. so those things all kept the prices of the of labor low right and now and so we've had this like kind of 20 year period of very, very low inflation because of all those factors that were at work at the same time. Mm -hmm. Now that that period may have ended. So we may right. be going back to kind of like historically where what used to be normal for the entire period between, you know, most of our history. Yeah. That three three to five percent inflation. That was just what it was. Yeah. So did you um, see the uh Q3 GDP that printed this morning? It, it no, just I came didn't. out. Yeah. What so G it? So they were expecting 2.8. It came in at 2%. 2% oh. GDP growth and 5.3% inflation. Mm. Uh, and GDP is not uh, adjusted for uh, inflation. So in my book, a 2% growth when you have 5.3% inflation is a negative 3.3. It's right? a real contraction. Yes. Interesting. Yes. Yeah. And that's the second quarter in a row because in Q2, uh, I'll have to go back and look, but I think it was like 4.7% GDP mm. growth and Five, no, it was higher. It was like six point something inflation. You know, yeah. On an, on an adjusted basis, that's a two quarters of a. You know, that's that's a contraction. Yeah, yeah. It's not well, not good. Not, not, <laughs> have, yes, not good. Yeah, I want to have more growth than that for sure. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if this is if this is the time to talk about it or if we were going to do this in another session. But I I I what I wanted to just we're talking about this now. Mm -hmm. Sure. thought occurred to me that part of the labor uh pro like the labor shortage that we're experiencing right now and part of it like ryan said in his talk to my group was uh you know caused by demographics right that actually sure. actually the uh and he said it was evident before COVID started mm -hmm. right so yep. because it had already started back in 2019 there was already a, a labor shortage but just mm -hmm. nobody was really talking about it occasionally right. you'd see something in the press about it but nobody was really paying attention right so right. suddenly now it's become an issue because of the because we see these these uh, you know uh, bottlenecks yeah. in the economy but i think and there's something else going on here and and again you know, we've talked often before about sort of japan like the japanese economy mm -hmm. and how similarities and differences between you know japan and china or japan and the us and sure. one of the things that when I lived in Japan, and this is, you know, 25 years ago now, one of the things that was commonly talked about in Japan was the unwillingness of Japanese people to do 
what they called the three K jobs. I forget what that. So the three K, the K was like kitsui kitsui and something, which oh, okay. which basically means like dirty, oh, okay. ta- difficult, manual, and, and, so, and something else, right? Okay. So, and it was because like pretty much in every other developed economy, like they went Japan happened very rapidly, but they went through like massive transformation of their economy to the point where you know people just weren't willing to do. Mm-hmm. Hard, the hard jobs, the, hard, hard, jobs, the right. hard jobs anymore. And they so they couldn't find Japanese people willing to do it. And, and those jobs always didn't pay very well either, right? So mm-hmm. it's kind of like double whammy. Basically, the, the alternatives were better. People were able, they were well educated. They were, you know, mm-hmm. they had, so they were able to get higher paying jobs than that, right? Mm-hmm. So the only thing that they were able, that, the way they had to fill those jobs was through immigration. Right. Which is very, very, I mean, you think like immigration is a difficult issue here. Yeah. It's... Like, like in Japan, it's like they officially pretend it's not happening. Right. right. Because it's like they, you know, everyone looks really different. Right. The immigrants. Yeah. Right? And they tried, they tried for a while, like bringing in Japanese immigrants from Brazil. But of course, like there, there weren't that many of them. And plus, right. most of them also looked really different and they weren't really Japanese. Mm-hmm. They, they're, you know, they were like fourth, fifth generation Japanese or whatever. So that didn't really work out, you know, so, so they've had all, all their struggles with immigration, but the real issue was like, they had this labor problem, but they couldn't get these jobs filled because mm-hmm. Japanese people had better options. Sure. And we, it's also what's happening here now, mm-hmm. right? It's taken longer, but because of the demographic shift, like Americans don't want to do these jobs that are tough and low paying yeah right because they don't have to they've got yep. better options right and even the be- even the better option to take a low paying job that's not as difficult right so right. that could be like working at as a cashier or what have you like but they don't have to do some of these like dangerous really or dangerous like dirty, yeah. yeah yeah so i think that's where the third k was i'm forgetting the japanese word but it was, i think it was dangerous dirty and and difficult right or something yeah, so something like that yeah yeah okay. and so so i think i think what we're, we're seeing a lot of that here now too and you've heard anecdotally for years like you know these stories of like the farmers who are like okay i'm going to only hire americans yeah to, to, to pick my strawberries or whatever and like either nobody shows up at all or like people show up and take the jobs and they quit after one day because they're like i can't yeah. i can't hack it so you know that's also creating a bottleneck and we have and because immigration has been constricted under the previous administration and continuing under this administration. Yeah. That is also cutting off like a very necessary flow of, of workers to fill Mm -hmm. these jobs. Right. So that's another thing. And if you look at demographics in the country, basically a hundred percent of our, of our population growth has come from immigrants and their children. Correct. Right. There's Mm -hmm. basically zero. If we didn't have, immigration, we would have negative population growth. And then we would be basically like Italy or Ireland or, you know, mm-hmm. increasingly Japan, right? South, South Korea, places like that. So uh, I think it's, you know, we kind of got to, as a country, figure out what exactly we want to do about this, like whether we're okay with declining population and an aging population or whether we're not. And if we're not, then you're going to just have to open the doors, right? Yeah, and let exactly. more people in. Yeah. And so, cause you just, cause the economy, otherwise the economy is going to grind to a halt. So uh, that's, you know, it's kind of just the, the raw facts of the situation, but yeah. Americans don't have to take these jobs anymore. Right. No, I agree. And again, these are all choices, options. So they can do other things. They don't. So, and that's driving, it's driving, it's driving, it's driving up wages. Yeah, exactly where I was going. Wait, and wages go up, right? The, yeah. the one cure for this is payment. Yeah. Yeah, there's pay more. And then the other cure is automation, right? And actually Correct. in Japan, so I was watching, uh, I mean, actually it's fun. You don't see this stuff on TV in the US. So I watched Japanese TV with my wife and there was a, a we watched a show the other day about uh, about robotics, like mm. and the the jobs that robots are are doing in Japan. And mm. it's quite it's quite amazing. Like they can't find people to make like, to cook ramen in a ramen restaurant. Okay. So because the labor force is declining there even more rapidly than here. So they actually have machines. They're incredible that like are able to like from 
essentially unpacking the noodles, right? Uh -huh. Putting them into the boiling water, taking them out of the boiling water and putting them into a bowl, at which point just one restaurant worker then puts like the garnishes on, right? right? But they do the whole cooking process. Huh. And not only that, the, they interviewed some customers and the customers were like, we really like this because it's the same every time. Like consistent, sometimes yeah. it's consistent because a robot does it the same way every time. So like it used, you know, the, the, they would say the ramen was always good here, but like, depending on who was cooking, it might be a little different each time. Now it's always, it's really consistent. And it's, and I, that could be our future. And I, you know, it's sure. funny, I used to be really, really worried about automation in terms of replacing people, but now I, I'm not so much because I don't think that, it's not like those machines are cheap. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. But, but the people have bought them because they're necessary because right? they can't find workers. And yeah. so like, you know, you may see this happening here too. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. Great conversation. Again, I appreciate you sharing that video. It gave me a lot to think about. So uh, how can people follow you and get part of your world? Yeah. So there are a number of ways. One of which is if you would like to be an investor with me uh, looking for multifamily deals, uh, you can go to two bridges management and uh, or sort of just Google Two Bridges Asset Management. Don't worry about the URL, it's confusing. Uh, and there's an investor page, which you can fill out. So just fill out there and then you and I will jump on the phone and have a conversation. Or you can also join my free Facebook group, which is called the Multifamily Investment Community. Uh, just search for that on Facebook and answer the questions that pop up and you'll be in. I think you have like, was it 11,000 members or something? We're, a, yeah, we're closing in on 12, I think. Wow, so, that's awesome. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah, so. Awesome. Very cool. It's a lot of fun. Yep. Cool. Thanks, Jonathan. You're welcome. Thank you.